Welcome back to Combat Mission Black Sea, where we're going to jump into the ATGM versus tanks arena. This is pretty well trodden ground. The debate itself does the rounds every now and again, and there are videos on the subject from the Chieftain, Perrin, and Military History Visualize, which I'll link down below. Go watch them, they're really good. But I think that Combat Mission brings a bit more visualization to the table. It obviously has some limitations, and we're going to take a look at them, but as a means of seeing how realistically modelled tanks and anti-tank guided missiles interact in a competitive adversarial environment, I think it helps. This mostly comes from Chap and I having fought a rematch after the Battle in the Overlook video. If you want to watch the whole game, Chap has made a turn-by-turn -turn series, which I've also linked in the description. It was over pretty quickly, and it went really well for one of us, but there was one sub-engagement that was particularly interesting. So a bit of context, because context is God. This is a blue-on-blue -blue battle where both Chap and myself are playing as the Americans, squaring off in a meeting engagement over a Ukrainian village. The village itself is a place called Nikoshini, which is a real location just south of the Donetsk-Luhansk border that was fought over back in 2014-15. The map was made by Zveroboy1, and at the risk of completely filling the description with links, you can find it down below. I'm starting in the northeast as the blue side, and Chap is starting in the southwest as the red side, and we have the village and all the objectives in between us. This is not a tremendously balanced setup, because my access to the village is funneled by the vehicle impassable woods to the south, and Chap can easily punch forces out from his setup to flank that access route. I've worked all the time distance south, and I know that he can beat me to the farm on my left, so my plan is to cover that off and be ready to engage anything that shows up there. I've brought a reinforced Bradley company to the fight, so I have a lot of anti-tank weaponry. Specifically watching that flank, I have a half platoon, so two Bradleys and two infantry squads armed with javelins, plus there are elements of the rest of that platoon and another taking a position at the secondary school that can contribute. On turn 6, Chap rolls an Abrams up behind the farm. So we have our basic setup here. Toe 2B on the Bradley and javelin equipped infantry versus a single M1A2 set V2, or as modelled in Combat Mission Black Sea. To start off with some basic technical stuff, Toe 2B and Javelin can destroy this Abrams. The capability is not an issue here. Both are top attack weapons. This Toe variant flies over the target and fires a pair of explosively formed penetrators down at it. And the Javelin, of course, has the famous plunging attack profile. The top armor of the Abrams doesn't protect against direct hits from either of these. So, if any of them get on target, they're highly likely to do significant damage. Chaps Abrams is behind the farm, where my forces can't see it, or at least not directly. I have a Raven drone up and first platoon's commander, this is the platoon in secondary school, has eyes on it, and the information that a tank is behind the farm buildings has propagated through my force pretty comprehensively. I can't have it hanging around there threatening my flank, so I start shooting up the building it's hidden behind with the 25mm cannon on some of the Bradleys. The idea is to knock the building down, revealing the tank so I can engage it with ATGMs. This takes a little while, but it works. The rightmost farm building collapses just as Chap is pushing his Abrams forward to peek the corner. It takes a couple of incidental hits from 25mm high explosive incendiary rounds aimed at the building that probably don't do any meaningful damage at all, but it's exposed and it's out in the open. The Bradleys don't make the spot, they're concentrating on shooting up the building, but two Javelin teams do. One from 3rd platoon, about 600 meters out, and another from 1st platoon, which is only 200 meters away. The Javelin operators in both squads shoulder their weapons and start to aim, but the Abrams reverses out of sight before they can fire. Something similar happens a few turns later when Chap peeks the Abrams again. One of the Bradleys spots it and engages it with the tow, but the tank reverses out of sight just as it fires, and with nothing to hit, the missile flies off into the distance. So what's going on? ATGMs can only realise their anti-tank capability after they've done their guided missile thing. In all three of these instances, the weapon operators couldn't do that. This is really obvious with the tow, because the tow uses a sack loss guidance system. This means that the operator fires the missile and then keeps his crosshairs on the target. Information is exchanged between the missile and the operator's sight, in this case via radio, to make the missile fly where the operator is aiming. 
So when Chaps Abrams went back behind the building, the AI gunner in the Bradley didn't have anything to aim at anymore. The tank was visible when the missile was fired, but tow is relatively slow. It took about three seconds to cover the 600 meter distance, by which time the target was out of sight. There is a little aside here. Because the tow 2B flies over the target for the top attack profile, I don't think that it's impossible for it to still have hit the Abrams. The actual EFPs doing the damage are triggered by a laser profileometer, which basically detects when there's a sudden change of height beneath the missile, and a magnetic sensor. So even though the gunner can't see the target, in theory, the missile can still detect it and detonate if it flies directly over it and the sensors are activated. Someone with more technical knowledge might be able to shed some light on whether that's possible, but as it happened, in this case the missile was a little wide anyway, so maybe a bit of bad luck there. Javelin is a bit different. The operator uses the command launch unit to find an IR signature, then focuses on it to save that signature to the missile. When the missile is fired, it hones in on the signature. So Javelin is fire and forget unlike Toe, but where Toe has guidance time, Javelin has, for want of a better term, lock-on time. So the two Javelin teams aiming at Chaps Abrams weren't able to register the signature for the guidance system before it slipped out of sight. This is one of the drawbacks to ATGMs, the guidance systems require time to function properly, whether that is before or after the missile is fired. So Chaps spends some time playing peekaboo with his Abrams behind the farm. And this is a serious problem. The 120mm cannon of the M182 does not need time to lock on or time to guide its projectiles. These are leaving the muzzle at plus 1500 meters a second. So the Abrams here has what we could call a point and click interface, especially in this kind of 600 meter or less engagement. This means we have a situation where the Abrams can pop out, engage and pop back in again in relative safety because I simply don't have time to engage it with my ATGMs. For a more dramatic illustration of this at work, on another part of the battlefield we get this. Chap rolls a different Abrams up into a keyhole, and it can put a snapshot through this Bradley almost before it can react. And this is doctrinally acknowledged. Berm drills are explicitly built around the concept that tanks can minimize their exposure, but retain their destructive potential by popping up, shooting and disappearing before they can be engaged. The problem I have in these particular tactical circumstances is that I can't really do that. I really need to take that Abrams out because it's fixing me in my corner of the map. And because I can't play peekaboo effectively because of my longer engagement times, I'm relying on my Bradleys and Javelins remaining in their firing positions, trying to spot and engage Chap's tank quickly when it pops out. This is actually somewhat successful in forcing Chap to limit the amount of time the Abrams peaks. But that doesn't solve my problem, and he's able to bring his own javelin team up, hide it in the buildings and knock out a couple of my Bradleys. At this point, some of you might be wondering why I feel the need to have so many AT assets covering that flank, which is an entirely sensible train of thought. And to answer it, we can take a look at what happens when Chap finally decides to pull his tank out. He takes one last peek at the secondary school, exposing the Abrams to a javelin on the top floor. The operator sights in, gets a lock, and as the tank reverses off, fires. My forces lose a spot, but the javelin plunges down and explodes because it's been intercepted by an active protection system. Chap has brought the Abrams Mountain Trophy APS along, and that has shot the incoming missile down. This is why I had multiple ATGMs focused on that one tank. A single missile wasn't going to cut it because it would likely be intercepted, but two or more arriving in quick succession might be able to overwhelm the APS. The reason I know that tank has APS in the first place is that before switching it to the farm, Chap had moved it forward in the open ground on my left, where it was engaged by two Bradleys. Both fired toes, and both missiles were intercepted. So the tactical problem of trying to knock out this single Abrams with Javelin and Toe is actually really tough. It's not only ever exposed for a short amount of time, leaving a very small window for my ATGMs to either lock on or be guided, but the variant of trophy modelled in game has four charges. Notwithstanding the chance of the system failing or being damaged, that means my ATGM operators have to pull off a very difficult shot four times to deplete trophy's ammunition, and then do it a fifth time to actually score a hit. 
So in this particular engagement, my ATGMs have some tough hoops to jump through, and the enemy is holding some of the hoops and making life difficult. Also worth noting is that this was almost entirely a one-way range. The Abrams only got a single shot off in the entire engagement, so I didn't even have to deal with the problem of it shooting back that much. However, even with the active countermeasures of APS and minimized exposure, the ATGM is not necessarily out of the fight, especially once we get out of the box that combat mission is in. To start with, in our case the Bradleys are not just armed with tow missiles, they're also armed with a 25mm cannon. The combat mission TAC AI for the Bradley sees a tank and generally chooses to engage that with the tow, which is a sensible decision. But how effective would the cannon be against the side of an APS equipped Abrams at say 600 meters? Well we can go and test this out. The B-Fist is a Bradley variant that has the cannon but not the missiles. And when it engages a side on Abrams, it is capable of doing some damage. It certainly inflicts some partial pens and spoiling on the lower hull. And because cannon rounds travel much, much faster than ATGMs, the safety window for the Abrams would have for playing horizontal peekaboo is much reduced goes without saying that larger 30, 35 or 40mm cannon found on other IFEs like Warrior, CV90 etc are likely to inflict more damage. But what's more interesting is the effect that those 25mm AP FSDS rounds are having on the subsystems. Active protection systems like Trophy are necessarily outside the tank's armour, and that means that they're exposed to damage. In fact, there is actually a promo video from BAE Systems, yet another link below, in which a CV-90 specifically engages an enemy tank with air-bursting fragmentation rounds in order to try and blind it and damage its active protection system in order to clear the way for a follow-up ATGM strike. So one way that IFEs in particular can get around APS, and to some extent the fleeting target problem, is to use cannon instead of ATGMs, especially with larger cannon than the 25mm Bushmaster that have shells with greater penetrative capacity or the room inside to fit more sophisticated air bursting fuses. Related is the similar capability of mortar and artillery fragments to inflict that subsystem damage and degradation. This is something that Combat Mission probably under models. For example, to help knock down the buildings of the farm, I brought up an M106A4 and started dropping 120mm high explosive shells on it. Some of these landed close to Chaps Abrams or even detonated on the building right next to it in a way that seems likely to have sprayed the turret top with shrapnel and debris to the detriment of all the subsystems sticking out of it. So in an ideal world, this could have degraded the Abrams APS and allowed that on-target javelin to succeed. So degradation fire that can disable or damage active protection systems is a thing, and although IFEs can engage in this directly, a somewhat less risky option that is also open to the infantry is to try and engage a target with artillery or mortar fire, preferably before it even reaches the battlefield. It's also worth pointing out that, obviously, hard kill active protection systems do not have unlimited ammunition. Our entire game here lasted barely 20 minutes, but the farm Abrams used up three of its four trophy charges. Granted, the combat mission context here is not necessarily that realistic, but that's a high rate of use. I have no idea how practical it is to reload an APS system on the battlefield, but if it is practical, there will also be a natural limit to how many reloads can be carried as well. So the protection offered by hardkill APS is not infinite. It will at some point run out of interceptor charges, and given their extended ranges, numbers and their ability to conceal themselves, ATGMs will probably be in a position to take advantage of that. Also frequently overlooked is the fact that an ATGM can achieve tactical effects without actually scoring penetrating hits. The point of anti-tank guided missiles is to make tanks go away. Ideally, they should make tanks go away permanently, but making them go away temporarily is also useful. If we go back to the survivability onion, a successful APS interception is the last thing before testing the armour itself, and this is very bad. It means that you are in harm's way. The enemy have identified you, acquired you, engaged you, and would have hit you if it weren't for the APS. So even if an ATGM is intercepted, it's communicating to the receiving tankers that there is a threat present and that they need to react because they might not be lucky twice. That reaction is probably going to involve popping smoke, taking evasive action, seeking cover, 
or otherwise prioritizing their survival over doing whatever it is they're there to do. And although probably temporary, that's not a trivial impact on the enemy. So there are workarounds for the ATGM. Obviously some of these are riskier than others when the tank is shooting back, but they're there. Finally though, to round things out, we need to take into account some important caveats. The first, and most obvious, is that this engagement is technically limited. There are a lot of different types of ATGMs and countermeasure systems out there, and swapping the inputs can significantly change the outputs. In particular, hard kill active protection systems like Trophy are expensive cutting edge bits of kit that not everybody has access to. APS has, for example, been conspicuously absent from the war in Ukraine, at least up until September 22 when I'm recording this. And without Trophy, I would have killed Chaps Abrams three times over. Shifting from the technical to the tactical, it's worth considering that this particular contest is taking place in a combat mission quick battle shaped box. In the rigid confines of a combat mission environment, players are able to make an accurate judgement about the level of threat. They know something is likely to happen, that's why they're playing the game, and they have no problems examining the terrain in perfect detail with as much time as they like, and estimating actual or potential enemy lines of sight. Making an accurate judgement in reality is much more difficult and relies heavily on a high standard of training and knowledge of opposing weapon systems, as well as the knowledge and exploitation of appropriate terrain. So tanks will not necessarily be taking active measures to minimize their exposure in the way that Chaps Abrams did at the farm. There should be plenty of opportunities for ATGMs to engage targets that are exposed like the Abrams was when it was approaching and leaving the cover of the buildings. This neatly lines up with data from World War II, which suggests that tank and anti-tank combat generally comes down to whoever gets the first shot on target, which is usually whoever starts the engagement. This makes sense because the engagement initiator can choose to open fire on their terms when they think they have a high chance of success, and because the target is usually unaware that someone is aiming at them until it's too late. In other words, the two elements that contributed to the survival of Chaps Abrams here, APS and consciously minimized exposure, are not guaranteed to be present in all engagements. So hopefully this has cast a bit of a light on ATGM tank interactions in modern warfare. The tank is definitely not dead or obsolete, and neither is the ATGM. They compete in intersecting technical and tactical challenge response dynamics, and there are a lot of ways in which they can interact that favor one, the other, or both. One of the most interesting parts about combat mission is that you can watch those play out. Hope you all enjoyed this video and found it interesting. I'll catch you in the next one.